Hi, today I'll be analyzing the funeral oration by Pericles, which is considered to be one of the greatest speeches ever written. So, some context before we start. The speech was supposed to have been delivered by Pericles, an eminent Athenian politician at the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, as a part of the annual public funeral for the war dead. So, the Peloponnesian War was fought between the Athenians and the Spartans. This was after they had collectively defeated the Persians in the Greco-Persian War, but now there was conflict between Athens and Sparta. At the end of the war, Sparta won, but this particular speech was delivered one year into the war, and this entire public funeral was a well-accepted practice among Athenians, where army people who had died recently were collectively buried. They were collectively remembered, and this was a part of their law. So when Pericles starts his speech, he starts with a justification of his speech. He says, why exactly is it that the speech is being said? He says, most of my predecessors in this place have commended him who made the speech part of the law, telling us that it is well that it should be delivered at the burial of those who fall in battle. For myself, so he is slightly dis disagreeing there with the law. He is slightly disagreeing with his predecessors. I should have thought that the worth which had displayed itself in deeds would be sufficiently rewarded by honours also shown by deeds, such as you now see in this funeral prepared at the people's cost. By this paragraph, he is doing two things. Firstly, he is saying that these soldiers showed their worth by deeds and therefore they are rewarded by these deeds as well. And he's also justifying the usage of the person, the people's cost, the usage of the public money into the preparation of this funeral. He then continues by saying, and I could have wished that the reputations of many brave men were not to be imperiled in the mouth of a single individual to stand or fall according as he spoke well or ill. He's trying to say that it is wished by him that the reputations of many brave men should not be risked by the eloquence of one speaker because it's not a very fair thing. So that is a disagreement where he is, right? He continues and says, for it is hard to speak properly upon a subject where it is even difficult to convince your hearers that you are speaking the truth. On the one hand, the friend who is familiar with every fact of the story may think that some point has not been set forth with that fullness which he wishes and knows it to deserve. On the other, he who is a stranger to the matter may be led by envy to suspect exaggeration if he hears anything above his own nature. So he's addressing two kinds of people. He's saying that some people are friends, they're close to the topic, they know about it. And that is why they feel that the story is not being said with enough fullness. It deserves more. On the other hand, the people who do not even know about the matter properly, they become jealous, they become envious, and that is why they suspect exaggeration if they hear anything above their own nature. He says, For men can endure to hear others praised only so long as they can severally persuade themselves of their own ability to equal the actions recounted. When this point is passed, envy comes in, and with it, incredulity. So, a very smart thing that Pericles establishes right in the beginning is that if you feel at any moment that I am exaggerating about these people, then perhaps it is because you are envious. Perhaps it is because you cannot yourself equal the actions that they have done and that is why you are envious of them and that is why you are suspecting exaggeration. So, right in the beginning, he is building credibility about what he is going to say. He says then, however, since our ancestors have stamped this duty with their approval, it becomes my duty to obey the law and to try to satisfy your several wishes and opinions as best I may. As best I may, by saying that he is doing two things. First of all, he's showing that even with my slight amount of disapproval, I do agree, I do accept the law and I'm going to do my best. At the same time, he's expressing his humility. He's saying as best I may because I might not do justice. I might still not be enough to do justice to all the people who have lost their lives, but I'll do the best that I can. He then says, I shall begin with our ancestors. It is both just and proper 
that they should have the honor of the first mention on an occasion like the present so this is a tradition that he's continuing this is something that has been done earlier it's the correct thing to do and that's why he's doing it they dwelt in the country without break in the succession from generation to generation and handed it down free to the present time by their valor and if our more remote ancestors deserve praise much more do our own fathers who added to their inheritance the empire which we now possess and spared no pains to be able to leave their acquisitions to us of the present generation why is it that pericles talks about our own fathers and not our remote ancestors by doing that he is helping us visualize he is helping the audience visualize exactly what he is talking about because it is not very very easy to visualize long lost ancestors that you have never seen however it becomes very easy to visualize your own fathers your direct predecessors so by that what he is trying to do is also shifting the focus from the past to the present to the more recent past which can be easily visualized and understood and also so that he can continue with his agenda lastly there are few parts of our dominions that have not been augmented by those of us here who are still more or less in the vigor of life while the mother country has been furnished by us with everything that can enable her to depend on her own resources whether for war or for peace that part of our history which tells us of the military achievements which gave us our several possessions or of the ready valor with which either we or our fathers stemmed the tide of hellenic or foreign aggression is a theme too familiar to my hearers for me to dilate on and therefore i shall pass it by so note here he says we or our fathers again referring to the audience directly and people the audience can directly visualize and understand and actually empathize with and he's talking about we it is our valor that has led to these military achievements it is our fathers valor that has led uh, that has led to this entire country that we are living in right now this great mother country so the entire kind of thing that he's building up right now on is patriotism but at the same time at the end of this paragraph what he's doing is that he is saying that we already know about the history we already know about our, this particular theme of military expansion and our achievements of our history and that is why i shall pass it by by doing this he is departing from tradition traditionally when this kind of a speech was delivered it was expected that these military achievements were talked about at length however pericles deems something more important and therefore he is passing it by how is he justifying it he is justifying it by appealing to the intelligence of the audience he is saying that you already know about this you already are aware about this therefore i shall pass it by he then says but what was the road by which we reached our position what the form of government under which our greatness grew what the national habits out of which it sprang these are the questions which i may try to solve before i proceed to my panegyric upon these men so he says right in the beginning the structure of his speech he is saying before i begin with the panegyric upon these men i will answer these three questions that is how exactly did we reach this position how did we become this great what was the form of government that enabled it and thirdly the national habits out of which it sprang and we'll come to know why exactly is he doing that he is setting the objective here and then he is justifying it by saying since i think this to be a subject upon which on the present occasion a speaker may properly dwell and to which the whole assemblage whether citizens or foreigners may listen with advantage and now he starts listing he says our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states we are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves now what he's trying to do here is showing that athens is a particular state that is a natural ruler it is not an imitator it is the trend setter it is a natural leader of the world its administration favors the many instead of the few this is why it is called a democracy and he is doing this also to contrast with other nations right he is contrasting this directly with sparta where there is a very rigid class system where the few are in much advantage and they enjoy much more as compared to the many and this kind of a contrast is what he is trying to build here he says if we look to the laws they afford equal justice to all in their private differences if no social standing advancement in public life 
falls to reputation for capacity. If you do not have social standing, your public life can still advance if you have the capacity. Class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit, nor again does poverty bar the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. The freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from exercising a jealous surveillance over each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbour for doing what he likes or even to indulge in those injurious looks which cannot fail to be offensive, although they inflict no positive penalty. He says uh, in this final point that even in our ordinary life, we enjoy certain freedoms. We are not exercising surveillance over each other. We are very liberal. We do not mess with what our neighbours are doing. We are not trying to overstep our boundaries. And we are not even indulging in injurious looks. We are not even mocking others in that particular way for what they are doing. That is the kind of freedom that we enjoy in Athens. But all this ease in our private relations does not make us lawless as citizens. Against this fear, this fear of lawlessness, is our chief safeguard, teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws, particularly such as regard the protection of the injured, whether they are actually on the statute book or belong to that code which, although written, yet cannot be broken without unacknowledged disgrace. So the people here are, you know, they are not only following what is on the statute book, they are also following an unwritten code because they want to remain graceful. And that is how a particular thriving society is built. He then says, Further, we provide plenty of means for the mind to refresh itself from business. We celebrate games and sacrifices all the year round, and the elegance of our private establishments form a daily source of pleasure and helps to banish the spleen, while the magnitude of our city draws the produce of the world into our harbour, so that to the Athenian, the fruits of other countries are as familiar a luxury as those of his own. By talking about games and sacrifices and pleasure, he is contrasting directly with the Spartan hard life, the military life of the Spartan where pleasure is not looked favourably upon and is not really seen as an option at all. So he's just trying to show Athenians how great Athens is and he's also trying to show that this kind of pleasure, this kind of luxury is unparalleled in other places. If we turn to our military policy, there also we differ from our antagonists. Note the use of the word antagonist. Instead of using the word enemies, when we use the word antagonist, it refers to Athenians as protagonists. We are the main characters. We are the people who are naturally deserving to be here. The other people who are hostile towards us are antagonists. We throw open our city to the world and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing although the eyes of an enemy may occasionally profit by a liberality, trusting less in system and policy than to the native spirit of our citizens. While in education, where our rivals, referring to Spartans again, from their very cradles by a painful discipline seek after manliness, at Athens we live exactly as we please, and yet are just as ready to encounter every legitimate danger. In proof of this, it may be noticed that the Lacedaemonians do not invade our country alone, but bring with them all their confederates, while we Athenians advance unsupported into the territory of a neighbour and fighting upon a foreign soil usually vanquish with ease men who are defending their homes. So several things to unpack here. Firstly, he's talking about how in Sparta, from their very cradles, they lead a particular painful life. They have a very disciplined life seeking after manliness. In Athens, we do not have that kind of a restrained, disciplined life. We can encounter pleasure and at the same time, we are ready to encounter every legitimate danger. And he says in proof of this fact that we can encounter legitimate danger, even though we are living exactly as we please, he says that, you know, we are not invading in groups while other people might invade our country in groups. We are invading unsupported. Not only that, we are going unsupported into the territory of a neighbor and fighting upon a foreign soil and still being able to defeat them very easily. People who are defending their homes. 
so now defending some defeating somebody on home turf is a huge accomplishment right even now in army rhetoric the entire phraseology that you are going and defeating somebody on their home on their home ground on their home turf is something that is seen as a huge victory so obviously that kind of a rhetoric is being used here he says then our united force was never yet encountered by any enemy because we have at once to attend to our marine and to dispatch our citizens by land upon a hundred different services so that wherever they engage with some such fraction of our strength a success against a detachment is magnified into a victory over the nation and a defeat into a reverse suffered at the hands of our entire people he talks here about the kind of publicity or the kind of pr that those people are trying to accomplish for themselves and he's trying to discredit that right he says that we never go fully we never go as an entire army to any one place we have hundreds of different services at sea or on land now what these foreign armies do is that if they are losing to us then they act as if they have lost to our entire forces so it's in completely justifiable victory but if they defeat even one group of us then they act as if they have won against our entire people now this is something that he's probably addressing because of this entire reputation that spartans have of being able to defeat armies which are much larger than them in very small armies spartans were able to defeat much larger armies so he's trying to discredit that kind of a reputation he's also discrediting other foreigners by trying to bring forth this argument he then says and yet if with habits not of labor but of ease and courage not of art but of nature we are still willing to encounter danger we have the double advantage of escaping the experience of hardships in anticipation and of facing them in the hour of need as fearlessly as those who are never free from them a very very important paragraph what he is trying to say here is that our habits are not of labor but of ease we are not toiling since we are born we are living at ease we are living in peace our courage is not made of art it's not artifice it is not artificial it is not made up we are not trained to be courageous we are courageous by nature we are willing to encounter danger even though we have led lives of ease and that is why we have a double advantage we have the double advantage of escaping the experience of hardships in anticipation that is what the spartan life is is that they are in anticipation of hardships they're leading their entire lives in hardship and what our life is is that we are not leading it in that way we are not living in anticipation of hardship we are living freely but at the same time we are willing to encounter danger the second advantage is that since we are never since we are never entirely in the fear of some kind of an anticipation of hardship since we are not fearful of hardship we can also face fearlessly the hardship when it actually arises in the hour of need we are able to fearlessly face it as compared to those people who are never free from that hardship then he says nor are these the only points in which our city is worthy of admiration we cultivate refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy now what he's trying to say here is that while sparta has this entire culture where from their cradles people are trained to go for masculinity to try and attain masculinity we have cultivated not only military strength we have also cultivated refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy he then says wealth we employ more for use than for show and place the real disgrace of poverty not in owning to the fact but in declining the struggle against it about wealth he says that we are not wasting away wealth we are using it rather than showing it we are not wasteful with our use of wealth and he also says that the real disgrace of poverty is not in claiming or owning up to the fact that you are poor but in declining to struggle against poverty what he's trying to do here is twofold first of all he is trying to praise athens for what it is at the same time to the audience he is trying to build up an aspiration he is trying to tell them that whatever wealth they have they should not be wasting it away they should be using it rather than showing it so he is doing a signaling to the audience as well as to how exactly they should act to be the graceful athenians they are expected to be 
He then says, Our public men have, besides politics, their private affairs to attend to, and our ordinary citizens, though occupied with the pursuits of industry, are still fair judges of public matters. For unlike any other nation, regarding him who takes no part in these duties, not as unambitious but as useless, we Athenians are able to judge at all events if we cannot originate, and instead of looking on discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action, we think it an indispensable preliminary to any wise action at all. He says what? He says that we do not see people who are not engaging in public matters as unambitious. We see them as useless because of which everybody is compelled to take part in public matters. He also says that we do not look on discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action. We see it as an indispensable preliminary to any wise action. By that, he's justifying democracy. He's justifying the actions that are being taken by Athens and he's also glorifying it. He then says, again, in our enterprises, we present the singular spectacle of daring and deliberation, each carried to its highest point and both united in the same persons, although usually decision is the fruit of ignorance, hesitation of reflection. But the palm of courage will surely be adjudged more justly to those who best know the difference between hardship and pleasure and yet are never tempted to shrink from danger. Again, he goes back to the initial distinction that he was trying to make. He says that since we know hardship and pleasure both and still do not shrink from danger, we are the more courageous. He then again has a call to action, right? He talks about how in generosity, we are equally singular, acquiring our friends by conferring, not by receiving favours. Yet, of course, the doer of the favour is the firmer friend of the two, in order by continued kindness to keep the recipient in his debt, while the debtor feels less keenly from the very consciousness that the return he makes will be a payment, not a free gift. And it is only the Athenians who fearlessly of consequences confer their benefits not from calculations of expediency, but in the confidence of liberality. So now here, what he's trying to do is that he's trying again to build an aspiration among people. Not only is he glorifying Athenians, he's also trying to build an aspiration in those people who are not as generous to be generous like that. He's talking about how it's considered a marker of firm friendship, of continued kindness by which the recipient is always kept in debt. And the debtor is also very conscious of that fact. And this kind of a relationship is hence built. He also talks about how Athenians confer their benefits not from calculations of expediency, but in confidence of liberality. So what he's trying to do here is again trying to talk about how important it is to be generous like that. And then again, you might also think of it as a justification for a future call for spending into the military. Because over there, their confidence is in liberality, not for an expedient return on their investment. And again, if any of this feels like it's too much, if it feels like no people could be this good, then he has already addressed that in advance by saying that if you cannot believe this, then you're probably envious. You're envious and that is why you're thinking that we are exaggerating about these Athenians. That is what he had established right in the beginning. Only if you cannot recount these actions, only if you cannot actually trace back these actions to your own life, will you be envious of the glory of those people who are actually doing it. And that is how he's trying to build that aspiration. He then says, in short, I say that as a city, we are the school of Hellas, while I doubt if the world can produce a man who, where he has only himself to depend on, is equal to as many emergencies and graced by so happy a versatility as the Athenian. He's talking about how in a particular city, in a particular world, where a man can only depend on himself, nobody would be as happy as an Athenian because we are so versatile. And that is no mere boast thrown out of the occasion, but plain matter of fact. The power of the state acquired by these habit proofs. For Athens alone of her contemporaries is found when tested to be greater than her reputation, and alone gives no occasion to her assailants to blush at the antagonist by whom they have been worsted, or to her subjects to question her title by merit to rule. Again, 
there's this entire kind of a justification of Athens being natural rulers, right? Because Athens alone is found to be greater than her reputation. Athens alone gives no occasion for the assailants to blush if they lose to Athens because it is just natural to lose to Athens. It is expected because Athens is that great. And the subjects do not question her title by the merit to rule either. How true is it? We do not know. But if you're exaggerating, if you think I'm exaggerating, probably it's because you're not as great yourself. Rather, the admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, since we have not left our power without witness, but have shown it by mighty proofs and far from needing a homer for a panegyrist or other of his craft whose verses might charm for the moment only for the impression which they gave to melt at the touch of fact, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring and everywhere, whether for good or for evil, have left imperishable monuments behind us. So what he's trying to do right here is a very common tactic. He's putting somebody very famous down to raise his own credibility. Homer is so popular a figure by talking about how Homer cannot be trusted because it cannot be fact-checked. He's trying to say that while his verses are charming, they are charming for a moment because if you would try to touch it with fact, if you try to actually verify its truth, then the impression would melt away. But that is not the case for Athens because we have left mighty proofs and monuments which are imperishable. So he's again, he's trying to put somebody else's credibility down to raise his own credibility. He's trying to put down the verifiability of Homer to contrast it with the verifiability of the greatness of Athens. Such is the Athens for which these men, in the assertion of their resolve not to lose her, nobly fought and died. And well may every one of her survivors be ready to suffer in her cause. Finally, after having resolved his initial objectives, now he has come to his eulogy. Now he has come to the men and he'll address them right now. And he's talking about why exactly is it, uh, why exactly is it that he was talking about Athens at length? It is because he had to talk about Athens first to show why exactly is it that these men nobly fought and died. He then says, Indeed, if I have dwelt at some length upon the character of our country, it has been to show that our stake in the struggle is not the same as theirs who have no such blessings to lose. And also that the panegyric of the men over whom I am now speaking might be by definite proofs established. He says that our stake in the struggle is not the same as theirs. And he also says that we have already by definite proofs established the panegyric of these men. That panegyric is now in a great measure complete for the Athens that I have celebrated is only what the heroism of these and their like have made her. Men whose fame, unlike that of most Hellenes, will be found to be only commensurate with their deserts. What he says right now is a very, very smart way to cut short the part of the eulogy, right? He says that in this particular description of Athens, the glory of Athens in itself, I have completed my panegyric of the people as well. Because Athens is like this only because of the heroism of these people. Note the use of the word heroism. Because soldiers are heroes. Warriors are heroes. And the word heroes is used in this context very, very frequently because who is a hero? A hero is somebody who risks their own life for others, for the common good, for the greater good. And it is the heroism of these people. This is the heroism of these men who have lost their lives that has allowed Athens to reach such glory. And if a test of worth be wanted, it is to be found in their closing scene. And this not only in cases in which it is the set, the final seal upon their merit, but also in those which it gave the first intimation of their having any. For there is justice in the claim that steadfastness in his country's battles should be as cloak to cover a man's other imperfections, since the good action has blotted out the bad, and his merit as a citizen more than outweighed his demerits as an individual. He's appealing to certain kinds of people by this part of the entire speech. He's appealing to those people who crave societal approval, people who are not that well-reputed maybe, that they can still blot out their bad actions. They can still be celebrated. 
because their merit as a citizen would be proved if they were to join war. That would be a cloak to cover their other imperfections. He says, but none of these allowed either wealth with its prospect of future enjoyment to unnerve his spirit or poverty with its hope of a day of freedom and riches to tempt him to shrink from danger. No, holding that vengeance upon their enemies was more to be desired than any personal blessings and reckoning this to be the most glorious of hazards, they joyfully determined to accept the risk to make sure of their vengeance and to let their wishes wait and while committing to hope the uncertainty of final success in the business before them, they thought fit to act boldly and trust in themselves. Thus, choosing to die resisting rather than to live submitting, they fled only from dishonour, but met danger face to face, and after one brief moment, while at the summit of their fortune, escaped not from their fear, but from their glory. So now he's trying to characterise soldiers as well. He's trying to glorify certain characteristics. He's trying to talk about how they joyfully determined to accept the risk. They acted boldly. They trusted in themselves. They would rather die resisting than live submitting. He's trying to raise aspiration in people. He's trying to raise aspiration in the audience. He's trying to tell the audience that this is how you should be. You should die resisting rather than to live submitting. And to actually be able to to actually be able to rouse them he's trying to use the example of these people also by eulogizing them by showing the kind of glory they get and also by trying to very very you know, like clearly identify that they are not escaping from fear but they're escaping from glory this kind of an escape that he's talking about is a euphemism he's not talking about how they died he's not trying to help people visualize how they died whether they died on foreign land, in terrible conditions, etc., etc., because their pain is not the focus here. The focus here is their glory. The focus is on the silver lining. So died these men, so died these men as became Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have as unfaltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier issue. Now he's turning to the audience directly. He's turning to the audience directly now. After having put on some kind of a build-up of aspiration, now he's directly giving them a call to action. That you must also determine to have as unpoltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier issue. He's not saying that a happier issue is guaranteed. He is not saying that it is guaranteed that they're going to win. It is not guaranteed that they're going to succeed. But still, you may pray for that to happen and you should have as unfaltering a resolution to not escape from fear and not contended with ideas derived only from words of the advantages which are bound up with the defense of your country. Though these would furnish a valuable text to a speaker even before an audience so alive to them as the present, you must yourself realize the power of Athens and feed your eyes upon her from day to day till love of her fills your heart and then when all her greatness shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage sense of duty and a keen feeling of honor in action that men were enabled to win all this and that no personal failure in an enterprise could make them consent to deprive their country of their valor but they laid it at her feet as the most glorious contribution that they could offer a very direct call to action that he's making but at the same time he's nudging them he's not saying that you should do it because i said so you should do it because i listed these particular points but because you have realized the power of Athens and you have fed your eyes upon her from day to day and you are filled, you're filled with love for Athens so that you're able to understand why exactly is it that these soldiers agreed to lay their lives at the feet of Athens as a very glorious contribution. And only then, only then will you also be able to offer your valor for Athens. For this offering of their lives made in common by them, all they each of them individually received that renown which never grows old, and for a sepulchre not so much that in which their bones have been deposited, but that noblest of shrines wherein their glory is laid up to be eternally remembered upon every occasion of which deed or story shall call upon its commemoration. For heroes have the whole earth for their tomb. And in lands far away from their own, 
where the column with its epitaph declares it, where there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten with no tablet to preserve it except that of the heart. What he's doing here is that he's trying to justify why exactly is it that you should be willing to lay your lives in a foreign land. The idea of not being buried, the idea of not having your remains recovered, the idea of not being seen for a one final time by your family might be uncomfortable. And the idea of not having a tomb might also be very uncomfortable to many people. But heroes do not need to fear that because they have the whole earth for their tomb. They have people's heart and that particular heart enshrines their memory and they do not need a tomb for their bones or their remains. So by this, he is also forming the fears of the people regarding this kind of a thing. At the same time, he is trying to pacify or rather give some kind of a comfort to the families who might not be seeing the remains of their sons, who might not be seeing the remains of their family members. He is offering them comfort by saying that it's okay if their bones are not being buried, if their bones are not in a particular tomb, because their tomb is in every single heart, because they are heroes. These take as your model and judging happiness to be the fruit of freedom and freedom of valor, never decline the dangers of war. For it is not the miserable that would most justly be unsparing of their lives. These have nothing to hope for. It is rather they to whom continued life may bring reserves as yet unknown, and to whom a fall if it came would be most tremendous in its consequences. And surely, to a man of spirit, the degradation of cowardice must be measurably more grievous than the unfelt death which strikes him in the midst of his strength and patriotism. Note why the word surely has been highlighted. It's a kind of an allusion. He's not directly saying anything here. He's not directly saying that you should not be cowardly. You should actually go for death. What he's doing instead, he's appealing to people. He's appealing to men here that surely to a man of spirit, if you are a man of spirit, that is, you would not choose to be degraded by cowardice because that would be immeasurably more grievous than a death which is unfelt. In the midst of your strength and patriotism, the death that you have will be unfelt. In comparison to that, cowardice will be degrading and it will be much more grievous and it will be immeasurably more grievous than that unfelt death. And therefore, you should choose that death, that unfelt death. Also understand that by using the word unfelt for death, he's also trying to remove that visualization of pain, of blood, of horror. Instead, again, he's talking about patriotism and glory. He then goes ahead and says, Comfort, therefore, not condolence, is what I have to offer to the parents of the dead who may be here. Numberless are the chances to which, as they know, the life of a man is subject. But fortunate indeed are they who draw for their lot a death so glorious as that which has been caused your mourning, and to whom life has been so exactly measured as to terminate in the happiness in which it has been passed. He says here that life has several chances. Death may come at any moment. You never know when you're going to die. But these people who have chosen when to die or rather how to die are fortunate. They have actually drawed their lot for a death which is glorious. And that is why they are so fortunate and so much better, so to say, than the others. Still, I know that this is a hard saying, especially when those who are in question of whom you will constantly be reminded by seeing in the homes of others blessings of which once you also boasted. For grief is felt not so much for the want of what we have never known as for the loss of that to which we have been long accustomed. So he's being sensitive here. He's addressing the pain of parents. He's talking about how you will be reminded of your own sons. You will be reminded of your own blessings by seeing the blessings of other people in their homes. Because grief is not felt for something that you have never known, but rather for something that you have long been accustomed and then you have lost. 
and then he goes on to a, another call to action towards these parents. He says, yet you who are still of an age to beget children must bear up in the hope of having others in their stead. Not only will they help you forget those whom you have lost, but will be to the state at once a reinforcement and a security. For never can a fair or just policy be expected of the citizen who does not, like his fellows, bring to the decision the interests and apprehensions of a father. So now immediately he turns to a call to action and says that you people who can still beget children must immediately bear up so that you can not only replace your lost sons, at the same time, you will also be providing a reinforcement to the state. Because you can, you know, you can only be a just citizen, a correct citizen, if you like your fellows, if you like your fellows bring to the decision the interests of a father. So by saying like his fellows here, what he is appealing to is called argumentum ad populum. He's appealing to the masses. He's saying that look at the other people. The other people, your fellows, are great citizens and they are giving up their sons. If you are not doing that, then you are a bad citizen. So that kind of an appeal is being made here. He then says, while those of you who have passed your prime must congratulate yourselves with the thought that the best part of your life was fortunate and that the brief span that remains will be cheered by the fame of the departed. So he addresses both those people who can beget children as well as the people who cannot do that. For it is only the love of honour that never grows old. And honour it is, not gain as some people would have it, that rejoices the heart of age and helplessness. He continues appealing to these old people that it is not gain but honour that will rejoice your heart in your old age. And your honour will never grow old, which is why you should give up your sons. Turning to the sons or brothers of the dead, I see an arduous struggle before you. When a man is gone, all are wont to praise him. And should your merit ever be so transcendent, you will still find it difficult, not merely to overtake, but even to approach their renown. He's appealing to the sons or brothers of the dead now. And he's saying that you will never be able to transcend their glory, their honour. The living have envy to contend with, while those who are no longer in our path are honoured with a goodwill into which rivalry does not enter. He's saying over here that rivalry cannot even enter this goodwill of dying in war. So he's trying to appeal to these sons or brothers of the dead to also join if they ever want to be able to transcend their glory or not transcend, but at least reach their glory because anything else that they do will never be able to reach their goodwill if they do not enter the army. He then says, on the other hand, if I must say anything on the subject of female excellence to those of you who are now going to be in widowhood, it will all be comprised in this brief exhortation. Great will be your glory in not falling short of your natural character and greatest will be hers who is least talked of among the men, whether for good or for bad. So he is basically advising women to now, who are now widows to lead very normal lives, quiet lives without engaging with other men. And that is all that he does because he does not really have any use of them. So to say, he cannot really appeal to them to give sons or her husband or anything like that. So now you lead a very nice, quiet life and that will be your glory. And then he concludes. He says, my task now is finished. I have performed it to the best of my ability. And that is what his objective was. He said right in the beginning, I will do to the best of my ability. And now he says he has done it. And in word at least, the requirements of the law are now satisfied. He says that again out of humility. He says that the requirement of the honouring of the dead is now satisfied in word. But I do not know how well it is being done in reality. But at least in word, I have done it. And the rest, let us see. Because I am humble, I am not trying to claim that I am able to honour so many dead people at once. So many glorious dead people at once. He says, if deeds be in question, those who are here interred have received part of their honours already and for the rest, their children will be brought up till manhood at the public expense. The state does offer us a valuable prize as the garland of victory in this race of valour for the reward both of those who have fallen and their survivors. And where the rewards for merit are greatest, there are found the best citizens. Again, there's a kind of a virtue 
in being associated with the army. He says both the people who are fallen as well as the survivors, both of them get rewards. They receive this garland of victory in the race of valor. And where rewards for merit are greatest, there the best citizens are found. So these people are the best citizens for being associated with the army in that particular manner. And he says, and now that you have brought to a close your lamentations for your relatives, you may depart. With this, he's authoritatively resolving the entire speech. He is also dictating to the crowd now in a way that with this, you have brought to close your lamentations for your relatives. Now come to emotional resolution. Now do not lament any further. Go on with your lives now. And I've already told you what to do. Because he has already taken various groups of people and addressed each one of them as to how they should continue with their lives. With that, we come to the end of Pericles' speech. And it is very, very interesting to note the various kinds of phraseology that is used, the entire patterns that are used, the way he addresses various categories of people, the format that is used. And now it has become a very, very common format for future politicians. And it is used very frequently. And we shall see that in upcoming videos as well. Thank you for watching. Hit a like if you like this video and comment if you want me to analyze any particular speech in the future. Thank you.